He deserves to be glorified. God is so good. He has orchestrated this day in just a perfect way. He woke us up this morning, started us all on our way. We ought to glorify him for that. Greetings, my name is Joseph Willis. It's an honor and a privilege to be standing here on today. Uh, Pastor Scott is over at Bethel, uh, sharing over there. And so I was asked to stand, just like my brother, Pastor Kurt, was asked to stand on last week. Um, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for all that you are accomplishing even right now. God, we learned way back when that it was your breath that brought us life. Job would proclaim that your breath is the source of life. Jesus, once resurrected, would breathe on his disciples the Holy Spirit. And we would find in the book of Timothy these words that all scripture is bread from your mouth. And so, God, all we ask on today is that you would breathe on us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy eyesight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And all the people of God say, amen. amen. We have been traveling through this series called This Is Us. Pastor Scott opened this series up and we've been talking about different things concerning us as a church body and us as individuals. And we will continue in this series on today. Um, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. Um, Galatians 5, beginning at verse 22. Scripture reads these words, give ear to Paul. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. For the moment that is ours, I want to lift up for a subject where our help comes from. Where our help comes from. Uh, this text opens with the word but. But is a conjunctive word that shows a contrast to what's being said now versus what was said before. Now let's go back and look at what was said before. Verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual morality, impurity, sens sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right here, we see a conversation that Paul is beginning to have, a topical conversation concerning the flesh versus the spirit. Yeah. Now, this conversation just didn't start in chapter 5. It started at the very beginning of Galatians. See, the Galatian church, uh, when established, had been established on one principle only, Jesus Christ crucified. That's all they were built on. Jesus died for our sins now we can live free in the love of our God the Father. Uh, but that soon after the church had started, some false teachers had crept in, teaching a false gospel. And what they were teaching was this, that yes, Jesus is good, but you also need to be obeying these Mosaic laws too. The Ten Commandments to be clear. Uh, not only that, you need to get in covenant agreement with us, fellas, and get circumcised. Uh, 
In other words, in so many words, these false teachers were teaching that Jesus wasn't enough. And Paul spends the next four chapters dispelling that false gospel. And in so many words, Paul says, Jesus is all that you need. And if I could say it like this on today, Jesus is enough. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noon day. Jesus at the midnight hour. He is all that you need. Don't add anything to him and don't take anything away from him. He is everything. You're all in all. Uh, Jesus is all that you need. Then Paul transitions from talking about having faith in the Lord to being acceptable by having faith in the Lord that you will be acceptable unto God to then talking about this conversation that we're talking about today. The difference between the flesh and the spirit. Um, and Paul says, in so many words, that it is impossible for the flesh to please God. Uh, you, you can do all that you can, and you might please him for a moment in the flesh. But you cannot sustain pleasing him in the flesh. Uh, this brings up a couple viewpoints concerning salvation. Now, there's way more than what I'm about to touch on, but I'm going to touch on three because I want to point out something that's going to lead us somewhere. Um, the first viewpoint is from the person who is unsaved. They have not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. However, they believe that all of this, all of this creation, all of this intelligent design did not just come out of nowhere. They believe that there is a God somewhere and that we didn't evolve from primates, that this all wasn't created from some kind of big bang. Uh, they have not come to the fullness of their salvation or re receiving the free gift of salvation for one, one, several, one big reason, because they haven't got themselves together yet. They'll say things like, let me get myself right first before I step into his presence, which is actually a, a good thing. Um, but at the same time, it puts a wedge between God the Father and his child. Uh, they, they say things like, let me get all of this out of me first before I commit. The next viewpoint is the, from the person who is saved, who has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they're trying their level best to do exactly what God has called them to do. Um, but because they are around folks who create an atmosphere of perfection, when they mess up, when they fall short, they fall completely away from God. Guilt and shame hop on their backs and weigh them down so much that they begin to pull away because I messed up. The third viewpoint, and again, this is just three, there's many more, but I just want to focus on these three, is the person who has been saved for some, quite some time now. Uh, they, they know all the right words to say. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Uh, blessed by the best. They got the, the big cross and the big Bible. They know all the scriptures. Um, but they act as if they never do anything wrong ever again. Like they've never had an impure thought. Like they never had an impure word for somebody. Like they never had impure moments in their heart. They act as though they don't sin anymore. And by doing so, they have lessened the effectiveness of the cross. Because it's simply this. If you don't sin anymore, then why did Jesus die for you? Jesus died for your past, present, and future sins. And if you say you don't sin anymore, then what did he die for those future sins for? 
all three of these viewpoints have one thing, in, have two things in common. The first, and these are two major flaws, the first is that they all depend upon the flesh. The flesh, again, cannot please God. Secondly, they drive a wedge space between God the Father and his children. Now, for the two groups that are saved, I'm not, don't hear something I'm not saying. I'm not saying that they lost their salvation. That is eternal. But the relationship, the intimacy is being wedged with this thought process because of the works of the flesh. And this is what Paul is getting across to the readers in Galatia, that the flesh cannot please God. And since the flesh can't please God, then we must rely on the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. He, bring, he brings the Holy Spirit into the conversation. And when he does this, I, if I can be transparent for a moment, as I was going through this, this lesson, I, I, I had to do some self-evaluation. Uh, because um, I felt like I did a marginally good job worshiping God the Father. Uh, not for what he's done, but just because of who he is. Because of who you are, I give you the glory. Because of who you are, I give you the praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and I will say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. I did a marginally good job worshiping God the Father. I've done a marginally good job worshiping God, worshiping God the Son. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. Uh, I, I worship him. And let me add this parenthetically. This is the one main distinction between world religions and Christian belief. Because world religions all recognize that Jesus was a pure, that Jesus walked this earth, first off, that Jesus was pure in motives, that he was perfect while living on this earth, that he glorified God well. But that's where they fall off. Because when you ask the question, do you worship Jesus Christ? They, they, they get quiet. Uh, the Bible says, that there will come a day that every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Um, so we ought to worship God the Son. But when I looked at how I worship God the Holy Spirit, I had gaps in my worship. So this led to two questions. The first question was, well, why don't I worship the Holy Spirit like I should? And that answer came to me and it said, you don't have a high enough viewpoint of the Holy Spirit. See, I saw the Holy Spirit as just a comforter. I saw him as just an intercessor. I saw him as just a sealer of my faith. But the Holy Spirit is much more than that. Uh, Genesis 1 begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God. So while God the Father was speaking, God the Holy Spirit was moving. He was there from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit is the protection for Israel in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit was Samson's strength. The Holy Spirit was Daniel's safety in the lion's den. The Holy Spirit was Isaiah and all the other prophets' prophecy. The Holy Spirit put a baby in the womb of a virgin named Mary. 
The Holy Spirit is the convictor of sin. The Holy Spirit is the power that all of us need to live like Christ. He deserves your praise. Then this created the next question. Well, how do I worship the Holy Spirit? And I believe Paul answers that question today. Uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 22, says these words, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, peace, excuse me, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against us thing there is no law. The answer to that question is yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. We worship him by how well we yield and how well we do not grieve him. See, back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would, would come down and initiate some action and then would go back. But in the New Testament, because Christ has been the complete satisfaction of sins, the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. So when we are doing things that are not of his will, we grieve him. Uh, I want to show you, before we jump into these, these, these fruit, I want to show you something concerning the text that Paul was very intentional about doing. Verse 19, he says, now the works of the flesh. Notice how the word work is plural. Go back to verse 22. But the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. See, the indication that Paul is giving us right here is that the works can be picked and choosed at your leisure. Like you, you, you can pick to, be, to have fits of anger. You can choose to be envious or to choose to, to, to be uh, Ill, uh, Ill motive. You can choose those things. But when it comes to the spirit, this fruit is not able to, you're not able to pick and choose. This is a package deal. So then the question becomes, well, if I'm not living up to all that is this package, then why? And I will submit to you on today that it's because you're not yielding in that particular area. The Holy Spirit is there, and he brings with him these fruit. Let's talk about these fruit. Uh, the first one they say is love. This is an agape love. This is a love that is unconditional. It is not dependent upon what the person does to you or what the person can do for you. It is completely independent and it is a love that looks beyond faults and sees a need. Uh, joy. This joy is one that is unspeakable joy. Uh, I, hear, I hear somebody saying it in their mind, well, well Willis, uh, how can I have joy when all this hell is breaking loose in my life? Things keep coming up and again, over and over again. How can I find joy with that? First, remember that the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and he's bringing that with him already. Second thing is, we need to be more focused on three other things. First, that God chose us. Yeah. Second, that God redeemed us. Yeah. And third, that God is keeping us even right now. That's where our joy should be rooted. Uh, he says, peace. Now, uh, I know Texas is an open carry state. This ain't that kind of peace. You create your own peace. That's what uh, this peace is not one uh, where uh, it's, it's silence or like how you about to go to sleep and you got everything turned off. That, that's peaceful, but that's not God's peace. 
God's peace gives you peace in the midst of chaos. It is one that people can't understand why you're not tripping out right now because God has, I have God's peace on the inside. Uh, patience. Uh, this patience isn't like what we need when we're sitting in traffic on 610 trying to get our destination and we're running 15 minutes late. Uh, this ain't that kind of peace. I mean patience, excuse me. Uh, this kind of patience is the patience recognizing that God will fulfill his promise. That all things work together for the good of them. The call according to his purpose. This patience is not only just on his promises, but it is on the work that he's doing on the inside of you. God, I, I, I can't, I, I keep messing up in this area. Let him, let him work. Be patient with his work. Uh, kindness. This speaks of an integrity issue. This talks about the idea of how you handle folks. Uh, goodness. An uprightness in heart. Meaning that you, you don't, you, listen, you watch the news on any given night. You, you, you see other things other than goodness. Um, but this goodness keeps you in the midst of that. Faithfulness. This is a conviction and a belief that God has done all this work in me and he's going to keep doing all this work until I see him again. This faith, this belief that God will do exactly what he says he will do. Uh, uh, gentleness. This is a mild disposition. This person uh, doesn't, is not quick to anger. They're slow to speak. Uh, this person, this, this gentleness, this fruit is one that controls us from making rash and bad decisions. Uh, Self-control. This is having a mastery over your desires and your passions. Uh, let me make that plain. Uh, when you want to do X, Y, and Z, you don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, here's the thing about the flesh. Everything concerning the flesh is temporary. See, what, what, what Paul knows and what God knows, what the Holy Spirit knows, is that because it's temporary, you'll keep doing it over and over again to get the same feeling. But when you deal with the Spirit, that satisfaction is eternal. And so God is trying to get us to this place of being uh, under self-control. Now, one thing I want you to notice as well. Uh, these works of the flesh are outside in. You do these things and they infect, affect, poison you on the inside. The spirit is from the inside out. Now notice, none of these things are actions. These are all mindsets. Uh, the works are actions, the fruit is mindset which should lead to action. Um, verse 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Um, see, the Holy Spirit is dwelling, for those who have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is dwelling with you on the inside. Like I mentioned before, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come down, do something with somebody, and then leave again. But because we have Christ, and he's been the satisfaction, the atonement for all sins, the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside. So what, this is, what the picture that Paul is painting is this, that as the Spirit moves, you move just like that. The Spirit is guiding. We just have to do better at yielding. Um, watch this, verse 26. Let us not become conceited, 
provoking one another or envying one another. Um, this is a warning that Paul gives. And it's strange that he would put it right after this good news that we got that the Holy Spirit is on the inside doing all this miraculous work with us. Um, but it's a warning because he, he's doing this because he wants to make sure that when you start doing these things well, you don't think it was you. Listen, God chose, God saved, God keeps. You have no part in that except for yielding. Um, he also says provoking one another. This simply means, listen, I'm going to say it like this. Some of us are good button pushers in here. You know exactly the right button to push to get the reaction that you're looking for. Uh, and you know how to push that button at a moment's not notice. What this means is that you will not provoke a person to stumbling or doing some works of the flesh. Uh, next, envying one another. Don't look at somebody else's success at yielding and think that they got it better than you. In other words, God is working on them just like they're working on you. God is working on you just the same way he's working on them. Uh, there's no need to, to be in competition with somebody. Oh, they read their Bible eight hours a day? I'm going to do nine. Oh, I see them lay out hands like that. I'm going to do that too, but I'm going to put some oil on it. This, this is not that kind of work. Let the Holy Spirit work and let him move. So to answer the question, where our help come from? It comes from the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And all we ought to be praying for is that we can yield better to his power, his will, and his way. That is the message for this morning. May God have a blessing to his word. As we go to God in prayer, um, one thing I want to be intentional about on today, uh, because this text challenged me personally, it, it put before me uh, some choices to make. And I want to go in prayer for not only myself, but I also want to pray for those who might be in the same boat as me. Um, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need to be saved, and we all need God to keep on saving us. And so as we go to God in prayer, let's pray for that. Father God, we come first off saying thank you, God. We pray, Lord, that your word has gone forth and has hit fertile ground. God, reach the one who has not accepted your gift yet, but recognizes who you are. God, reach the one who has accepted your gift, but they struggle day to day with living it out. Touch the one who has gotten conceited in their actions. Get past that stony heart and give them exactly what they need. God, we don't know where we would be without you. We need you every second, every minute, every hour of the day. God, for those who have heard by faith the power of your Holy Spirit, may we be energized and gain zeal with trying to worship the Holy Spirit as we do the Son and the Father. One God, three in person. God, we adore you lift your name on high. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all the people of God say, as our prayer partners come,